Hi, guys. Thank you so much, Miguel, for letting me take part in this conversation tonight. And as you know, I'm going to be talking about treat to target and achieving mucosal healing. I want to remind everyone who's, you know, I don't know, a millennial, that in fact, this whole concept of mucosal healing isn't even something we talked about before in Fliximab. And it was really um, uh, Dr. Paul Ruckert, may he rest in peace, who, uh, who was an endoscopist and an ideologist and, and saw the value in, in following endoscopy as a, as a marker of people's response. And, and, and again, we didn't have, even, he have anything to talk about until infliximab came along and led to mucosal healing. And we could talk all day about how one defines muco mucosal healing, but for all intents and purposes, we're talking about endoscopic improvement that we see with our, with our eyes as endoscopists and quantify, as well as what's happening histologically. Uh, but if you get a more refined than that and start getting into the weeds, then of course there are variations. If you look at the at the fine print of clinical trials, how they've defined mucosal healing in different in different contexts. Um, I, I do, however, want to say that there's a, a bit of a difference in what we aspire to in a clinical trial and hold ourselves accountable at very strictly, and what what makes more sense to us in practice. These are the stride guidelines put out by IOIBD. We're about to come out with newer guidelines or kind of uh, 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 putting a little more information that has become available since this was published, but it's stuff that makes sense, right? As clinicians that we want, if it's ulcerative colitis for people not to bleed and, and have you know a normal number of bowel movements. And we as endoscopists should see that there's been resolution of inflammation and friability. And likewise, in Crohn's disease, aspiring to a clinical target target of not having abdominal pain and uh, and having at least significant improvement in ulceration, if not resolution. Um, in in older studies that have followed patients prospectively, those patients that had mucosal healing at the at the at the beginning of the study were those that were more likely to continue and do well and and not uh, require a subsequent colectomy compared to those that had inflammation at first at their first endoscopy um, there's um, certainly a lot of uh, uh, emer emerging data to support the idea that histologic improvement is an is also, some is also worthwhile aspiring to, given that uh, David Rubin and others have shown that by having um, reduced inflammation um, microscopically, there is a, a less of a likelihood of, of colectomy and less of a likelihood of going on to colitis associated dysplasia and cancer. And so these are all really important aspirational goals that we, we want for all of our patients. Um, and how do we get to those goals? First, you have to set a goal, right? So that you can start working towards that goal. And so this treat to target concept is just that, is trying to set a goal. In many cases for each individual patient that you're going to have um, time points along the way that you're gonna check in to see if in fact um, there has been uh, improvement or a resolution of inflammation in a particular person. Uh, and for, for, most, for most patients, I decide up front if that person is someone who's going to need uh, repeat MR enterographies or is going to need repeat procedures or is going to need serial fecal calprotectins to see if I've achieved that target. So each person deserves their own target. But when why the, the most compelling data we have to support that a treat to target strategy uh, is something that is uh, doable and uh, and meritorious is the COMP study. And this was uh, John Fred Columbell and his colleagues did a study where patients, you know, had inflammation, they had Crohn's. They either went into a tight control arm where they were being followed with fecal calprotectins and CRPs to see not only were they feeling better, but were they also better biochemically. And a group that just was being followed clinically. How are you feeling? Are you having diarrhea or abdominal pain? No, fine. And they were left where they were. And so I chose one of many data points that was evaluated in this study. And you can look at mucosal healing rates. And what you can see here is that those patients that were under the tight control group where they were being serially monitored and followed and their, their medicines adjusted to try to achieve that goal actually did better than the ones that, that they were just kind of uh, reporting their clinical symptoms. So it has to be more than just following clinical symptoms for our patients with IBD. This can also be done in real life. This is a study from Bill Sanborn's group at UCSD, where they have their real life cohort of patients that they follow. And you can see that there are patients that got dose adjustments 
uh, based on whether they had achieved mucosal healing or not. And those patients that they actively scoped them, found inflammation and said, you know, we will, we're going to adjust your medicines to get rid of that inflammation, actually were able to achieve mucosal healing. So I think this is doable. And there are various studies both in real life as well as in clinical trials to support that approach. How do we get to that, right? How do we get to mucosal healing? Well, now we have a lot of different uh, choices in how we get to mucosal healing. For all intents and purposes, we've mostly been dealing with biologic agents that are monoclonal antibodies against very specific targets. And I'm going to share with you some of the some of the um, some of the um, inherent issues with that approach. First of all, we've seen that for some of our best therapies, in order to get more bang for our buck, we need to actually to combine them with immunomodulators to improve mucosal healing rates. And so now you're, you're having to use two medications, some to combat some of the inherent um, uh, some of the inherent idiosyncrasies of some of the, of the biologic agents we have uh, currently. Um, some of the lessons that we've learned from using monoclonal antibodies as antagonists of inflammatory pathways is number one, patient acceptance. You know, these monoclonal antibodies, which are synthetically made proteins, they, can't, they cannot at present be given via an oral route. So they need to be given parenterally, whether that's IV or sub Q. And I don't know about you guys, but every patient in the, in the initial discussion associates that with chemotherapy and associates that with something that means that they have worse disease and that this is something that's bad for them, right? So we have to always be combating that initial uh, uh, reaction. Um, there's issues with adherence. Uh, IV is of course better than giving someone something sub Q, but now we have home infusions and th people fall off one's radar and are not having such good outcomes. There are issues with clearance and immunogenicity related to these uh, to these uh, biologic medications that I'll, that I'll remind you and discuss. And then, of course, we have the opportunity to do therapeutic drug monitoring, which I view in a favorable light. However, because of interlaboratory variation and inter, inter, individual targets of, of TDM, that, that also has not been so easy to tell a doctor in practice, you need to have a level, your patient should have a level of this and anything below that doesn't work. Um, one of the other issues with monoclonal antibody-based therapies is the fact that in order to get sort of consistent effect, there has to be drug on board, right? I explain it to my patients as having the, some gas in the tank all the time. And so what you can see is that if trough levels start getting below that, you know, below that when the when they're in empty, right? When the, the tank is in empty or I have a Tesla when the battery is already in the yellow, um, that it allows the disease to come back, right? It's, you know, they're, they're no longer being maintained in remission. They're having that roller coastering of having inflammation in between doses of the medication, right? We are aware of the things that are associated with an increase in drug clearance, things that are associated with getting rid of the, of the monoclonal antibodies too quickly. Most of it has been learned with TNF antagonists, but I think some of that can carry over to all of these protein-based biologic agents. If you have a low albumin and you have protein loss, you're going to have a protein loss of, uh, of other monoclonal antibodies as well. We now, I think probably, I hope in the not too distant future, we'll have, we have the ability to check for this polymorphism in HLA, uh, in the HLA DQ region that is very uh, highly associated with developing antibodies to uh, infliximab and adalimumab. And so this is the percent with no anti uh, drug antibody. So you want to be here in the blue. Here in the blue are patients that don't have this polymorphism and are on an immunomodulator. Down at the opposite end are patients that have the polymorphism and are not on an immunomodulator. So what you can see is that within a year, those patients that have this polymorphism and are not on an immunomodulator, uh, almost 100% of them are gonna have antibodies to the drug. So this is not gonna be a winning strategy for those patients. And hopefully we will be able to use this prospectively to maybe avoid uh, using uh, using infliximab or adalimumab altogether. This doesn't seem to be as important for ustekinumab or vetalizumab as it is for um, as it is for infliximab and adalimumab. Um, another thing that I wanted to highlight with respect to at least some of the anti-cytokine based strategies that we use that are monoclonal antibodies. One monoclonal antibody, for all intents and purposes, is going to bind one molecule. Um, you know, we can get into the details with TNF about that, but essentially um, there has to, there's a proportionality between the amount of, of, uh, of ligand and the amount of antibody that needs to be present. And that in a way 
is an inefficient way to try to suppress inflammation. It means that the more inflammation, the more you need to douse it with more and more of, in this case, anti-TNF. And so if you could get at the inflammation at a more central point and not have there, there be this linear one-to-one relationship between ligand and, uh, and antagonist, that we could probably have a more stable um, response to therapy. So how can we be more proactive in IBD patient management? Um, we have a better understanding of the predictors of outcomes in IBD. We can monitor disease better in asymptomatic patients. Uh, and therefore, I think now we have the opportunity to really use a treat to target approach and individualize that approach for each patient. I'm going to turn that um, the conversation over to Dr. Rubin, who's going to talk to us about uh, medications with other mechanisms of action.